Welcome to the All Glider Podcast, episode six. As always, big shout out to our sponsors. Again, we're sponsored by Coral Sea and Spindrift. You can find Coral Sea at CoralSea.com and then Spindrift Tactical at SpindriftTactical.com. Uh, both owned and operated. Uh, Coral Sea is owned and operated by ex Australian Sniper and Spindrift Tactical is owned and operated by current servant Royal Marine Snipers. We have a massive thank you today to Mike for joining us. I know you're in Puerto Rico enjoying some time off, mate. Thank you. Welcome, Matt. I appreciate it. No, it's not, um, really good to have you on. Um, and I know for a lot of people, they're going to see the thumbnail, they're going to know straight away from the picture um, that obviously you've, you've, you've been in Ukraine for a bit of time, but would you like to give us a bit of background about yourself first? Um, what uh, you did yeah. before? Yeah, for sure. Um, I grew up in the country, in the U.S., uh, state, North Carolina. Um, just old country boy. Joined the Marine Corps at 17, uh, practically right out of high school. I uh, did a year. I was medically discharged from the Marine Corps. My career ended before it could even begin. I was pretty disappointed. Um, I went into law enforcement, realized I didn't like law enforcement, <laughs> so I got out of that. And, uh, yeah, then I... I went to Ukraine in March, um, thought I could maybe help in some shape, form or fashion. Uh, my initial intention was if they needed a potato pillar, I would go peel potatoes. <laughs> uh, but uh, I packed my kit and everything. And when I got there, uh, an opportunity presented itself and uh, went for there from there for uh, eight months. Um, nice. So I. Uh, joined up with an american group in in ukraine uh march 7th and uh known as task force 10 and we helped out with the 119th out near chernihiv city uh towards the end of march uh, did some supply runs in kharkiv uh, did some training out near the belarusian border uh served alongside of 207 tdf and then i ended up joining the ivan bohana special purpose brigade um battalion a4044 and uh, we deployed into Luhansk, uh, and then a little place called Grigorovka, right outside of Sibirsk, and then Zaitseva, which was the village between Wagner and Bakhmut, uh, before it fell. Shit. So, okay, that's, fuck, it's a load. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, um, so going back, mate, so, you, obviously, with your Marine Corps, just get an idea, like, in times of, I'm assuming you finished training for the Marine Corps, did you get to battalion? Uh, so actually, about three days before my infantry training uh, graduation, uh, I had a medical issue and proceeded to get separated after that. I did finish boot camp. I earned my Eagle Globe and Anchor, became a Marine, uh, finished my infantry training. Um, so I was a basically infantry trained Marine uh, before getting, as we call it, green weenied out of the Marine Corps. Yeah, green weenied. I've heard that before. So you've had that. Yeah, so you have that that training. And so it's funny you should say that because we obviously, you know, Nick, and we had Nick on um for the last episode and he said the same thing about the police he did that for like what a year and he was like fuck that shit why would you want to yeah. do this yeah i did yeah. it i did it like a year and a half and then there was no uh no it's too much too much crookedness corruption in, in law enforcement and too much exertion of power and i just had no desire to be a part of it hmm and is that and i'm assuming you did that in north carolina i actually did that in virginia right uh that's where my family moved uh when i got a little bit older okay okay mm -hmm. it's yeah okay we've i don't know if we've discussed this before don't but it's like when you see all this stuff on the news about the police and then you've got the the blind support for the police when there's that realization that i'm sure it happens here it must happen in every police i don't think there's any country that has police that's well what would you call it 100 percent clean mm -hmm. did you find that it's it's that's an american thing in terms of it's, it's rife in america or is that certain states or uh, I think that as far as blind support for the police go, that's just an American thing. It's the way a lot of the young people were raised to simply back the blue or support the police without question. Um, I think that the corruption and the misdeeds by the police force, uh, it used to be, you know, one in a million. Uh, mm -hmm. You'd look at these instances or what was platformed to us. But now with more uh, uh, assessment to uh, technology and 
being able to spread information faster, we're now seeing more and more of these cases publicly. Um, and so it's just become a prevalent issue in the US. I wouldn't say specifically the US uh, as compared to the other nations in the world, but it's definitely a, a major issue for us in the US. Do you mind me asking, so when you say like it's corruption, is it kind of like the old um, Dave Chappelle joke of like sprinkling crack, like planting evidence, or is it just false statements? Is it like, I think that it's a mixture. Statements? I think it's a mixture of false statements, uh, covering themselves, uh, looking out for each other, uh, trying to to pad numbers, uh, get get the right number of arrests, um, along with the fact that they are every day becoming more and more just an arm of a st of the state. They're not uh, for the people as they were intended. Uh, their job is not to protect and serve. Their job is to enforce the law, regardless of what that law yeah. may be. Yeah. And so they just become more of an arm of the state. Uh, so I think it's a mixture of a lot of things. Yeah, it's very. I I don't. Um, I've seen a video on Facebook or uh, maybe on Instagram. It's one of the reels, and it's. I didn't know in America that maybe the same here, but if you're carrying like a certain amount of cash, say it's like a hundred grand in your car, well, some people like, surely you're entitled to do that. If you're, if you've got a hundred grand in the car and a policeman stops you and finds it, what he'll then do is then he'll call one of the like, the federal bureaus to come down and seize that cash just because it's over a certain amount. It then goes into their system. You can claim it back, but what happens is the federal system takes a cut. Then the policeman who, the the whatever county or whatever force he's from, they then get a cut. And by the time you get it back, it's like ten percent of the whole money that you've got. That's crazy. And that's the, the, yeah, the not, I, sorry, mate. I'm not sure on the exact amounts, but uh, things like that do happen. And mm. um, you know, our 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 Fourth Amendment. You know, we're supposed to be safe uh, from uh, you know search and seizure. Uh, things that are, you know, if we haven't committed a crime, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The Fourth Amendment's violated every day here uh, by police officers, um, and it's just a reoccurring issue. Um, so, it seems to be like you. Yeah, it's like a running theme, and I, I'm assuming, like, obviously, you speak about amendments. I'm obviously you support the amendments. I suppose you're like your two A support. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a. I'm a very staunch uh, constitutionalist. I'm not partisan aligned, not a supporter of Trump. I'm not a supporter of Biden. I'm not a supporter of Republicans or Democrats. Um, I align, when I look at uh, political parties in the US and decisions made by those political parties, if they don't align with the constitution, I don't support them. And that's why I withdrew my support from Trump in uh, 2018. And uh, I haven't supported any of the other candidates. Uh, I'm a staunch constitutionalist. And with that is the Second Amendment or 2A, as you called it. Hmm. And do you, do you think that had something to play in your decision to go into Ukraine? As far as the Constitution goes, no. Um, the, the Constitution is, is not for uh, any other country, the Constitution. No, the yeah, I mean so as, as far as my beliefs regarding that, uh, no, it didn't play any part in me going to Ukraine. But as far as uh, my uh, disgust for overbearing authority, overreaching authority, uh, misappropriation of, of government and governmental power, um, that played a huge part in me going over to Ukraine. And I wasn't someone who fell to the news media. I had been aware of Ukraine since 2010. I had friends there. And then in 2014, when the war broke out in Donbass and, and Crimea was annexed, um, I had been aware of it uh, mm. and studied it and researched it and really kind of been into the history of what was happening between Ukraine and Russia, along with the agreements made between uh, NATO and Russia and so on. And then when Zelensky called for volunteers in the end of February, uh, I, I was sitting at a, a bar in town eating a burger and I told the bartender, I said, I'm going to go over there. And he laughed at me. And within two days, I was on an airplane over uh, to Poland. So two days from making the decision. Yes. Jeez. So and it's a, so you're 22, aren't you? Yes, I am. I, I actually turned 22 sitting in a trench in lights of a side of Hawk move. <laughs> oh, that's a treat right there. Uh, I can think I've had better birthdays. That's for sure. Um, yeah. Talk to me about the process uh, from going from making that decision in that bar to two days later being on the flight. What was your preparation and, and how did you go about getting in contact did you make contact before you went or did you no i didn't i didn't make any contact i held married it um i got my gear together i already had gear i was very active in militia groups in the united states already had gear um 
and did some research. I went and spoke to the embassy, the Ukrainian embassy in Washington, D.C. I spoke with them. I didn't get the answers I was looking for. I was given an email and they told me it was going to be a process. And I said, well, that's going to take too long. I don't want to be a part of it. So I flew to Poland. Uh, I got into Poland and met up with a friend there who actually ended up uh, completely leaving, deserting and um, made up all these false stories about people ripping up passports and things like that. It was ridiculous. Um, very bad situation. But I met up with him and a British guy uh, who I won't I won't give the Brits name. Um, but we went into Ukraine uh, and the process in the early days was extremely simple. Uh, we initially started at the Georgian Legion, uh, the rear base and Dubliani, which is public knowledge. So I don't mind sharing where that where that's at. I didn't really vibe with the Georgian guys at all. Uh, and they didn't vibe with a lot of us foreigners at the time. Uh, mm. There was some conflict. Uh, we didn't want to mess with the foreign legion dudes because we met with some of them. And a lot of them were uh, a lot of the ones we talked to were like guys who had played Xbox. They didn't even have training. And I wasn't one to say, oh, well, I have combat experience because I didn't have any combat experience, but I at least had training. And, and these guys had nothing. So I didn't want anything to do with them. So we took a group of Americans and some others and went to Kiev, picked up weapons off the street in Kiev. They were literally just dropping boxes of weapons at the time. And uh, but by the time after, uh, I believe it was May, by the time May came around, uh, towards the end of April, uh, they started pushing real hard. All foreigners had to have contracts. You had to be, uh, you had to have your, your little book or um, you had to be contracted to have a weapon. Uh, serial numbers were being checked and matched against names and so on. And so we had to go through the actual process to get paperwork done. And that took some time. Uh, it's a little quicker now, uh, but it still takes time. Uh, but we had to do that. And then when we transferred, well, I transferred over to Ivan Bohuna, uh, Special Purpose Brigade. Um, my paperwork took maybe, I don't know, like a week. It took about a week. Uh, and I was stamped in and we were deployed with them. Um, so the process was pretty simple, but I went over there with no, I didn't have any context as far as the Ukrainian military. I just hell married it, said I'd find out. I figured a country <laughs> at war would take a fighter, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's, you spoke about the, the stories people were making up because we heard back here, there's, that's all you were hearing. You were hearing that there was guys going over, you were getting given body armor, but you were only given a front plate and they were tearing up passports. Was that, coming from the guys who wanted to get out? Do you think they were making these stories up yeah. just to make themselves um, better? Some of the, the body armor situations is true. There was very limited gear. Uh, when I hit the front line in March, I had two magazines. Um, I had soft body armor. I gave my kit to another Ukrainian guy who needed kit. He didn't have kit, and I picked up soft body armor. I ended up purchasing more kit later, but there wasn't much stuff to go around. Uh, so as far as equipment, a lot of these stories are true. As far as ripping up passports, uh, that never happened. And there were accusations of that stuff uh, from guys who uh, they either hit, got close to the front line and freaked out and then wanted to save face and acted like it was, there was an international incident that happened or something, uh, which ripping up passports would be an international incident. Or they would lie about things to try to save face or explain away why they were leaving Ukraine. Hmm. And that's where a lot of these stories came from. Hmm. And do you think this was, was this people trying to join the Foreign Legion or like you said, uh, guys like yourself who had went there and done this or were these specific groups of people or was it a mixture? I think it was a lot of guys that tried to join the Foreign Legion uh, or got there and were turned away by the Foreign Legion uh, potentially and then they had to bank up a story. Um, the way that we rolled, uh, there were a couple groups that rolled that way in the early days as far as going with no strings attached and just doing your thing, not taking it, you know, you're not paid, you're strict volunteer, you're doing x -field, stuff like that. There were some good solid groups out there that did that. Uh, but a lot of these guys that made up these stories were rejected for one reason or another from some specific group or something and couldn't find a home and had to make up a story. Uh, but I think a lot of it were guys who either joined up with the Foreign Legion and realized that, oh, this is a real war <laughs> or guys that, you know, were turned away. Yeah, I'd heard stories, eh? um, I can't remember what it was on, there was some group they were talking about, it. there was a guy that tried to join um, one of the Foreign Legion units, he got turned away, then he'd make up more stories and then go to the next one, tell them his experience, and his experience changed every single one, and then the commanders were all chatting, they were like, 
this guy keeps trying to join and he's fought in about 40 different wars by the time he got to the last one but yeah, it's, yeah I, it's, bet, I bet i've met a lot of people like like that and uh uh, I mean, we had one guy who couldn't even speak Hebrew, but had allegedly served with the IDF. Um, you know, it, it was uh, a very common occur- occurrence. Uh, there was a lot of like glory hunters, glory mm. seekers that weren't willing to put in the work for the glory. And so they would stay around and leech off of everyone else's time or their stories and try to like build their own. Um, and that's something that's still going on even in Kiev now. Uh, there's a lot of guys hanging around that are hanging out with some TDF training in Kiev and they get to put on some gear and they get handed an AK. They're not contracted. They don't have uh, papers or nothing. Uh, so they're not serving anywhere. You can't do that now. It's like beyond question. Um, you have to be contracted in to actually go fight now. Um, and these guys are posting up all these pictures or videos and stuff and uh, trying to get that glory. And there's a lot of people like that uh, that have gone into Ukraine. I mean, at the time there was uh, 20,000, allegedly 20,000 volunteers for the Foreign Legion. And when my former colonel, I'm not going to say his name, I, I try not to bring people into this, but uh, he transferred to the Foreign Legion uh, from the Ukrainian Special Purpose Brigade. And at the time, there was like less than 1,200 fighters in the Foreign Legion that were contracted. But yet we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dudes who are posting all this content that are supposedly serving with the foreign legion uh but knowing where the foreign legion is deployed and knowing these guys are not there that's a very common occurrence that's quite surprising because i can think myself purely from instagram telegram i can think it obviously not directly 1200 but there's a lot more than they would seem because there's a lot of guys posting content and i I can't remember who it was there was um someone we had on it may have been willie or it may be Nick, I can't remember. Someone had said that a lot of these guys are just back in Kiev or Lviv and they're taking photos next to this and you can you know exactly where it is yep. in Ukraine. And, yep. uh, and it's, yeah. And, you always and get... there, there was, I even had guys online that I met that were claiming at the time, this was probably in, uh, we had just rotated out of the Siversk area. Uh, so probably August, somewhere in there. They were claiming to be part of second battalion from the foreign legion and second battalion didn't even exist it was uh, on paper it existed it had a commander but there was nobody in second battalion nobody whatsoever they actually pulled uh guys from our company to start building second battalion and we had met people that had been serving in second battalion for two or three months at this point you know and it was just a complete a complete farce and it's a very 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 common thing in ukraine and most of the time you know you know who the who the ones are that are lying or haven't been in in anything because you can either connect with people they claim they know or uh, simple verification, you know, like uh, where, where's your green book? What contract did you sign? Um, especially now, like now, if they're not contracted, if they don't have a contract, they're not fighting. Uh, it's just, it, it's a simple thing now because you have to have a contract to be armed now uh, in Ukraine and fight. Do you think, um, do you think all these guys who are kind of like, doing this and actually not really fighting but basically taking pictures and putting on TikTok. Do you think that affected or impacted how like the Ukrainian military or government viewed foreign foreign fighters, how they used you guys? Negatively. I, I wouldn't say how I, I wouldn't say how they used, I would say, but it did impact how they viewed us. Um so the contract for like the Ukrainian army, which I signed, I did not sign a foreign legion contract. The contract for foreigners for the Ukrainian army when I joined the special purpose brigade was for three years. However, the eighth line of the contract says that we are allowed to leave or nullify in their contract at any point whatsoever for any reason whatsoever, as long as we provide that reason. Uh, And that's for foreigners. Um, However, because we were having so many guys join up and process through and get their paperwork and hit their first deployment and desert on the front line and there's no way to punish them there's 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 nothing in place there because they're allowed to end their contract they're allowed to end their contract and leave uh and the higher ups begin talk about what was rumored to us is like making us set you have to serve six months or you have to serve a year and if not uh you will be punished and the only punishment that they came up with at the time was like we had some people desert and they left ukraine completely uh they won't be allowed back into Ukraine for like three years, yeah. um, I think was some of the stipulation that they started placing on them. Uh, but there was a lot of 
uh, the military started looking at volunteers like, uh, wow, you guys are a farce. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. we don't we don't want any part of you, especially the higher ups. And um, then uh, a lot of the people in the Ukrainian military, they were happy to see us, like especially when like Americans and Brits rolled up. They knew that it was all, it was going to be all right, you know, like because no matter what happened, if we got a chance to fight infantry, which was a very rare occurrence, uh, Brits and Americans will one up Russia all day long. Like Russia does not stand a chance infantry infantry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys were happy to see us. Um, but in regards to faith from the higher ups in the volunteers because of what they had witnessed uh, from all these other wannabes, uh, it was very, uh, very low, very low faith. Yeah, I can imagine the issues that could be caused by some guy in a defensive position just getting up and bugging out. Oh, it own. happens. There's a gap Man, in it, and it, it's just the unit at risk. Like it happens so much, and um, it happened repeatedly too. Uh, I remember uh, one time specifically, I was deployed into Grigorivka. Uh, we had been there maybe I don't know, twelve or thirteen days straight. There was twelve of us, and ah, uh, let's backpedal. Let me backpedal a little bit. I'm assuming I'm okay to like kind of jump into Fill your boots, mate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so when the unit deployed to Luhansk, an entire group completely deserted. Like it was probably a hundred men from the unit deserted uh, from the uh, Ivan Bohuna Special Purpose Brigade. They just up and left, like just disappeared. Well, some of these guys were given a second chance, right? And so. They, after the loss of Luhansk and the withdrawal, uh, they served with us in Grigorivka. They were given a second chance. And of course, now I was I was very hateful towards these individuals. I got in trouble for being hateful to them. Um, I wrote messages on my boots so that every time they saw me, they had to see my boots because they would never look me in my eyes. They'd always look down and they would see my boots and <laughs> they would, you know, see how I felt. Um, Love it. And several of these individuals were Afghanistan war veterans. Uh, so maybe one from the UK, uh, there was a couple from Canada, uh, and several from the US. And God, I hope this doesn't get used on Russian propaganda. I killed enough orcs, they can use me as propaganda, I guess. It'll be all right. Um, but uh, we deployed into Grigorivka. We had been there maybe 12 days, 12 or 13 days. There's 12 of us. And uh, we're sitting under, we counted one day over 500 shells that that village took in one day. And it was concentrated on us because we were holding the line behind, I believe it was the 79th uh, Brigade that was holding the hillside. And our job was anti-tank. And if there was a break in the line, we were to stop it. That was that was our only job, those those two things. And I was serving with a great guy. Uh, I'll call him B. Uh, he was a Viking, um, probably one of the best guys I ever served with, just a go-getter. Uh, and it was, uh, it was maybe our 13th day. We got an order that... The line had broken, the 79th Brigade line had broken. So we proceeded uh, down the road under artillery fire, uh, heavy artillery fire. And we got almost to the line to realize that there's no break in the line. It was bad orders. And it just happens, you know, sometimes in war there's a miscommunication. And um, some, some of the guys, uh, we were able to push into the bunker uh, at that position. And then some... Uh, didn't make it. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, and I want to say their names. Brian K. Young from the U.S. Uh, Army veteran. Uh, he was killed on that road. Uh, Edward. Uh, Edward was a uh, lieutenant, I believe. He was from Sweden. He was killed on that road. Um, Emil. Uh, Emil was uh, Canadian, French. Uh, he was killed on that road. And Luke Lucizen. He was American, but of Ukrainian descent. Um, and uh, all, all of them were killed on that road. It was a, it was a very bad day, uh, but it's war. It's something that you just, it, it happens. And at this point, several of us had been serving uh, so long uh, through combat. This was probably in, uh, this was July. Uh, we had been serving for a while and it was just as terrible as it was a normality. It, it sucked, but it was yeah. a normality. Well, we get back to our former position and uh Maybe about four hours later, we get a ready, uh, ready call come across the radio. Told us, "Hey, the Russians have broke through the 79th Brigade line. The brigade's running and falling back. Y'all got to fix it." So the same order, right? And we had already lost four guys that morning, so there's eight of us left. Well, we get out there and we're looking around for the other four guys, 
and they're nowhere to be found. Like they're, and they had just up and it, it going back to what was said previously about it being a common occurrence, they just up and, and deserted us. Um, uh, one of them goes by AJ. I'll have to look for his real name. Uh, but him and some others, they just, they just left us like went back to HQ, got a vehicle and got out of there. And so we proceeded myself, my assistant grenadier, Levi, he was from Finland. Great guy. Um, uh, D, a guy named D, who was our machine gunner, uh, he had served in the uh, army here in the U.S. Uh, we head off down this road, understanding like, hey, there's only four of us. Um, we hit the line. The line had broken, came pretty much face to face. There was four tanks and four APCs had offloaded. However many Russians you can fit in four APCs. Hmm. I'm not sure how many. I think maybe 70 or something total. Uh, it was a lot. Uh, it was the longest firefight of my life. It was two hours and 25 minutes uh, of just constant fighting. Uh, living nightmare, uh, but it was once we kind of settled in and realized, hey, uh, they're not sending Artie while they're pushing. You know, it kind of got fun in a way. We were joined <laughs> by some uh, Belarusian fighters, maybe seven of them. So at this point, there's maybe 10 or 11 of us holding a, a brigade line that had broken against about 70 Russians. Uh, we ended up knocking out with the help of our drone man who was helping direct artillery fire. We knocked out a tank, one APC, and based upon videos, reports, and personal counts between all of us, we had accounted just between the four of us for about 17 Russians, give or take a little bit at this point. And we had only taken one wounded. Um, and he was part of another group that was there, uh, some of the Ukrainians that had returned uh, to that position. Uh, so for our part of that firefight, our personal group didn't take any injuries and uh, we laid the heat on them. But these guys just deserted us. You know, they just up and left us on the front line. Uh, and these were, you know, Afghanistan combat veterans. And this proceeded to happen repeatedly uh, and it just continued to play out. Uh, it, it played out outside of Bakhmut, the same thing, uh, just desertion from Afghanistan combat vets, which no disrespect to them. but the when the type of war that I was used to is Ukraine and fighting a world power, then it's normal for me to get orders to go take a position, not have air support, not have medic back, mm. probably half the time not even have a medic and uh, walk out on the road and a chopper lights the road up, you know, coming down the road. Uh, that's a common occurrence for these guys who served in Afghanistan. That's not a common occurrence. They always had superiority, superior firepower. They might have to worry about an IED or they got outside of their FOB once or twice on their deployment and uh, got to see a little action for a day or two, but sitting under constant arty and then getting shot at when you finally get out and break through or the Russians start pushing. Um, these guys were not used to that. And so when they would get put on the front line, a lot of them broke and, and left because it's not a war that they're used to. And that's a common occurrence all the way across Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. I said yeah. I said that quite a bit now, like what we do in Afghan. It was just like when it comes to like relatively to like warfare, how it can be, it was just a jolly. Like it was just people got hurt and killed, but it was just yeah, not really, not nearly as serious as what's happened in places like Ukraine now. Yeah, when you um, take take into what you the 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 worry in Af I suppose Afghanistan, obviously there's worry of stepping on an idea getting shot, mm -hmm. but there's never that worry that you'll get too long into a contact where Apache's not going to appear or you, yeah. you there's Pedro's on call or the Mertz on call. Yeah. Yeah. You know you're going to get out. If you get injured, you're going to get in that. But like you said, Mike, you don't know if you've got... You've not even got a medic, mate. That's fucking yeah, yeah, insane. Man. So it's, yeah. so, in, in terms of not having the medics and stuff, did you do your own medical training? I'm assuming guys disseminated it from what they knew from the forces before. Yeah, uh, a lot of us were doing our own medical stuff. Um, some of us, like I had, uh, like TCCC training, uh, tactical combat casualty care in the Marine Corps, uh, so I knew a little bit, um, actually lost a guy in April, early April, um, from, I, I, uh, he had lost his leg and I couldn't get a hold of his artery. And so some, some lessons were learned on the battlefield, uh, that we might've been taught, but had forgotten or mm. didn't remember in that, in the heat of the moment. So a lot of it was trial by error. And then uh, I will say that before my last, uh, two rotations outside of Bakhmut, uh, we had a group come to our unit, join our unit. Um, and I, I, once again, I, I can't say names, but he had served, uh, I believe it was Afghanistan, had been wounded there, uh, but he was a medic. And uh, one of the greatest guys 
I got to train under as a medic. Uh, really, really, really was well put together and squared away. I have mad respect for the guy, uh, but he was able to provide a lot of training for the unit on uh, like medical stuff uh, and help a lot of guys because if I can help you, that's all fine and good until there's 18 guys in the field and I'm the only one that can help you and I get myself mm. killed. Uh, then you're no good. And But if you can help yourself, if everybody knows enough to help themselves, uh, then that helps keep more guns in the fight. Um, you know, if you're in that situation of a firefight. And so we were able to proceed, receive a lot more training, uh, but in several places uh, across Ukraine, like for instance, a lot of the territorial defense units, these guys are getting sent to the front line. They've been sitting around in Kiev or they've been sitting around in their, or Zhitomer or Lviv, and they've had no training. They've just been sitting there waiting to be called up. Uh, I had guys killed in Zaitsevo. Um, it was, they had a one day rotation. They hadn't done anything since the beginning of the war. Um, and they had no training, they had no medical training, stuff like that. Uh, so not having enough medics was definitely a common occurrence. Jeez. How easy, how easy was it to get medical kit? Like, did you guys have tourniquets and bandages? Just the basic stuff, was that reasonably easy to get? Well, so I brought a lot of my own stuff over. Uh, we had volunteers drop off more stuff, but we also had a great, at the time, company medic. Um, and I... Uh, she went by Kiwi, uh, a, a great woman. Uh, she had, I believe she was from Australia, uh, and she was able to get a lot of things for us that we needed. If we needed, we asked for it. She made sure we have it. So everybody everybody had IFAX, uh, and then we had some extras, uh, you know, th throughout us, uh, uh, throughout a kit. Uh, but we were able to pretty much get what we needed through her uh, during my time in Ivan Buhona. Before that, it was a lot harder to get until supply chains were set up you know, March, April, and May area, everybody was setting up ways to get stuff in. So it was hard to get stuff during that time. And what was the um, the casual extraction plan like in terms of, um, was it just a case of get them treated on position and then withdraw them when you can? And I'm assuming there wasn't a lot of opportunity during most of these, these battles. Uh, no, uh, most of the time we didn't even have a casual evac plan. Uh, because there was no point in it, because it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, you call for help and you just wait for it to get there. Uh, there was no point in you planning a CASI back because uh, most of the time the other side's not going to listen to you. They're going to come in when they feel like it. And I, for example, and I'll give you an example. So we were fighting Zaitseva. Um, I had gone in, I was squad leader. I had, I went in with eight guys. Uh, we got our orders to go down this road, hang a left through Russian controlled territory. And hit a tree line and hold this tree line in between a Ukrainian position and a Russian position. And there were Russians at this point at our 12, at our nine, at our three, four, and five. So we were practically almost around and we're taking crossfire, right? And so we hit the road to get to these positions and my medic and three other guys, uh, I think two of which had served in Afghanistan, deserted us. Just, yes, yeah, said they were done because we started taking Artie, uh, chopper lit up the road, uh, bad situation. I don't judge them for that, but they left us. Um, they said they wouldn't proceed any further. They were like telling me, hey, we have to wait. And I'm trying to explain to them, hey, man, at this point, I've been fighting in Ukraine for seven months. There is no better time. You get, We got the orders to go. You just have to work through it. You have to f find a way through it. And um, we got into the position, four of us. <laughs> we go to the position. There's supposed to be 37 Ukrainians there. There's 14. 14 Ukrainians holding this position. And my job, my orders are to relieve these guys with four men. And so I follow my orders. I tell these 14 Ukrainians like, hey guys, go to your exfil point, you're good to go. They had been there, they were on a single day rotation. And uh, they're like, they're all happy to see us like Amerikansky, Amerikansky, you know, they're so excited. And they withdraw from this position. They had suffered no casualties in the day they were there. And retrospect and I try not to blame myself and I've been doing a lot of study for mental health and stuff but uh, so I, I try hard not to blame myself but it's hard not to but I gave them the order to go to their exfil point and in hindsight I should have gone with them and made sure they went like the proper way you should move and they didn't uh, 14 of them lined up on a road to go to their exfil point uh, with no, no proper spacing uh, and they marched right to the mouth of a tank uh, six of them were killed instantly, four were wounded. We got down there, we got the wounded out of the road, we got the dead out of the road uh, under fire. Uh, it was a very rough situation. 
But with that being said, the reason I'm telling this story is those four wounded, um, we had one with a sucking uh, chest wound, uh, another one with shrapnel through his throat, um, another one had wounds to his arm and leg, and another one had wounds to his leg. And as far as I know, they all lived. But they sat there uh, for maybe seven hours before a truck was willing to come in and get them loaded up. And, you know, I'm sitting there with these guys. I'm moving between my guys in the tree line. I'm crossing an open field uh, under Artie fire to get to the guys that are in this bunker to check on them, make sure they have water, make sure they have the stuff they need, uh, and then get back to the tree line and then make the run back and check on them again. Um, I had a great, great Ukrainian guy with me, uh, went by the name of Mech, um, and he helped me out a lot during that time. Very bad situation. We called, you know, hey, we need medical evacuation for these guys. That's all we could do. So there's no medevac plan. It's just it gets here when it gets here. Yeah. And um, those guys ended up getting evac maybe about seven hours after their injuries. So we had to stop the bleeding and, uh, you know, make sure they had water make sure they're not dying while they're waiting for medical help, you know, because the more death you can prevent on the battlefield is obviously the more lives you save. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and we were able to get them out of there. Uh, but it was like a seven hour process. So medevac is not something, you know, you see these videos online. I see a lot of these videos with these guys with their faces blurred out. They're in all this operating kit, you know, they got their little NVGs and, uh, these, you know, kitted out AKs and they're talking about doing a tactical, Xfil or a tactical medevac and yeah it's cool stuff but in reality the majority of the time if you're a foreign fighter you're in there and you're backed up by ukrainian dudes and the chances of them coming in to get you out uh if there's a threat it exists they're going to come get you but is it going to be on your time or their time generally it's going to be on their time and it's not going to be all this cool stuff that all these people make videos about it's just going to be they're going to drive a civilian pickup in there that has bullet holes through it somebody's going to cut like one of our trucks someone cut loose at it with a uh, atgm you know someone's going to cut loose at it and try to hit it uh you're going to throw the wounded into the back of the truck and hope them they survive the ride out you know um and a lot of people don't understand that reality of the war in ukraine uh, yeah. especially um and and i'm not calling anyone out specifically but if the shoe fits they can wear it uh there are these groups out there that you know appear to be all squared away and they were always shooting these promo videos in Ukraine. And, you know, they're blurring their faces out because they don't want no one to know who they are. But they're not really doing anything. They're trying exactly. to be tactic cool, you know. And it's frustrating. It's really frustrating as, as someone who's been on the front line, as someone who's lost buddies there and, and, and seen the reality of the war there. And then you see these people. And it's one of the reasons I started sharing content. I wanted people to see the real side of it. I didn't want people to sit here and think that, you know, you're kicking doors every day. Uh, you know, you you get to you get to do CQB every no. You sit under Artie. You sit under Artie. You sit under Artie. Eventually, Russians make a push. You might get a kick doors if you get to go on the offensive. Most a lot of the time, you're playing defense and shooting the trying to shoot the people coming at you. Um, you know, if they ever make it to you, uh, it's it's just a it's a whole different war than what a lot of these uh, groups are fronting as. You know, through social media. All right. All right. Yeah, they're almost larping, aren't they? That's what I would call it. They're, they're just LARPing. They're like fictional characters, like Willie said. Um, they're going there and they're being a character that they want to be, which is... Yeah, and it's... I, I think that is a, a bigger thing in terms of... Do you think these people are doing this and do you think it's helping in terms of drumming support? I mean, the guys who are making these like videos and, and, and all the gear, no idea type shit. Do you think they're doing this? Do you think it's actually helping or do you think it has a negative effect for for the general war effort? I think it's both. Uh, I think they are able to, I mean, it's, it's popular, especially among young guys that get to watch this stuff. It's popular for them. And I think it helps raise a little bit of awareness for Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a detriment because it attracts people like Afghanistan combat veterans who then picture this type of warfare being, you know, everyone's going to have GoPros, you're going to get cool video shots and you're going to be able to, uh, uh, you're going to be able to go kick doors somewhere, uh, and it's simply not that. And so they attract these type people who then show up and they either get themselves killed uh, because they prepared for something totally different or they desert and they embarrass others mm. um, or they cause a detriment. You know, they become a detriment to the front line because they desert. And now you're stuck there on the front line with minimal men. Um, and so I think it, it has its pros and its cons. Uh, and, and it's like the body camera stuff. I've got some body camera stuff posted to my page from my buddy's body camera who was usually behind me when we were moving. 
and I quit wearing a body camera after several of my buddies died. Uh, what was the point? Like, why am I going to video this stuff? You know, I've got to go through footage, editing footage. And it really, I'm sorry, I'm getting frustrated. I'm sorry. No, it's I'm okay. Sorry. Sorry, that makes sense. I understand why you're getting frustrated. Uh, yeah. It really, man, and these holidays have been tough. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, give me a second. No, it's okay, bro. It really, uh, it really pisses me off because, you know, I've got to, I've tried to go through some footage because I have a lot of people asking, hey, man, you got footage. Um, do you have stuff? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I can share some things, some things I'm not going to share. Uh, but I've got to go through body camera footage with my dead buddies laying there on the ground in the body camera footage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these operators show up in Ukraine and they're like, got all these body cameras on, on their kit and stuff. And it really blows my mind. And it kind of helps me know that these guys haven't really been through some serious stuff. Because until you have to go through your footage and you're looking at uh, your buddy Tommy laying there on the ground with no legs and you're seeing this again and again and again while you edit that footage, uh, it really gives you a different outlook. And after my first like two deployments, I quit wearing my body camera. I said, I'm done with this. I'm, there's no point in video and I'll fight. I'll do my job. I'll take some pictures here and there for documentation, uh, but but there's no point in it. And I had I had. The, the medic that did some training for us, great dude, he told me something that I'll never forget. And he asked me one time, he said, Mike, why do you take pictures? And I said, well, you know, I've got people that doubt my stories. And if I ever, you know, want to share, I want to be able to prove it. I want to be able to back it up. And he said, well, if you didn't tell any stories, you wouldn't have to back it up. And I said, that is true. And, and he was 100% right about that. Um, and I obviously understand the mindset of, oh, don't talk about anything. Uh, I talk about it because I'm proud of it. I'm proud I went over there. I'm proud I fought Russia. I don't like talking about some of my my brothers who didn't make it home, but I'll talk about, you know, killing Russian orcs any day of the time. I, I don't care about that. I, I hate those people. I hate their country. I hate everything they represent. I hate everything they stand for. And I will proudly talk about that and support that. But I will have to say that the statement that the gentleman made was 100 percent correct. Um, and a lot of these guys go over there with their body cameras because they want to get cool war footage. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is. Uh, you really start seeing some stuff, you'll quit wearing those body cameras. Because th why? Why? You know. It's yeah, almost a, yeah, it's almost a double-edged sword effect as well, because I think recently we've seen a lot more in terms of Ukrainian positions getting overrun, and a lot of the guys are wearing cameras, and the Russians are getting their hands on it, and it's essentially just opening up propaganda, isn't it? Um, propaganda, yep. And it's, yeah. Yeah, it seems... I, I definitely agree. No, it's okay, wait on you go. Oh. Uh, after you it's cool <laughs> yeah it seems to be um happening more and i think it's it does it, it's good in a sense that it does document the war and it shows the reality of it but in the same sense you always run that risk that it is going to fall into the hands and i think we have been seeing that a little bit more and more recently mm -hmm. especially as the information war picks up because ukraine from the start and the beginning pretty much have been winning the information war um and I think Russia have, have just really started to push more and more into that. I don't know how you see that from being on the ground and then coming off and seeing all the information that's getting put out there. How do you see that? Uh, it's it's frustrating, man. I've I've been I've been on holiday here in Puerto Rico. I've got a new job in the states. You know, I've been I've been working and um, really bad than going back to Ukraine. But after eight months of it, and I even I was switching units to redeploy so I could go fight again. Um, so it's not like I did a month on the front line and six mm. months on the rear line, like a lot of units with their rotation. I was, you know, I switched uh, to three different units uh, before I ending up with Ivan Bohuna uh, so that I could fight. And so after eight months of it, I'm trying to relax a little bit. But uh, in, in Puerto Rico, you know, I've been I've been making some videos and stuff and, and really sharing some things, you know, some of the content that I've I've shared uh, to attempt to raise a little bit of awareness of the devastation that's there. Not so much. Yeah, it's cool. You know, I've got some stuff with artillery coming in or, uh, you know, rounds flown, flying over our head that I've shared. And I've shared very small clips of these things. And, and these are like hour long videos from the uh, first two deployments where I wore my camera and then some from my buddy's body camera who was behind me a lot of the times. Um, and I was able to share some of this stuff. But I've been seeing through this and I shared on TikTok um uh through this i've been able to see a lot of videos about ukraine and russia and the war and body camera videos and stuff like that and i've seen a lot of the videos that you've spoken of 
Um, and I've also been able to see like people's perspective of, perspective of the war. And that's the most frustrating thing. That's, uh, you know, having been there, I was fighting in Donetsk, uh, you know, after the annexation, you know, you know, I was fighting on Russian land um, and talking to the people there. They never voted, you know, uh, jokes on Russia. I was there when they held the annexation and I didn't get a vote. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, these people never voted. They never want to be under Russia. Um, some of the 70, 80 year old people I met there, uh, I had a, a 70 something year old man tell me he would he would die fighting against Russia. Uh, because he didn't want it. he had lived under the USSR and never wanted to live under Russia again, Russia's rule again. And seeing this, not one person, not two people, not one guy pro Russian, one guy pro Ukrainian, but seeing this repeatedly across the board outside of Bakhmut, uh, in the Luhansk area, uh, in in the a lot of the cities and villages outside of Bakhmut, seeing it on, in uh, the Seversk area, seeing it in Gregorivka. There were like three people left in Gregorivka. There was like 40 houses. Now there's like two, you know, and seeing talking to these people there that they don't want anything to do with Russia and then coming back and seeing these videos, these, you know, misinformation videos or like Russian propaganda that's being pushed or Americans with their spoiled viewpoints or even Brits, you know, with their viewpoints and people saying, well, Ukraine, you know, there's there's. Ukrainians in that region, they want to be with Russia. Well, I don't know about those people, but I was there. I talked to them. They don't want to be with Russia. Nobody, th nobody there that I met wanted to be with Russia. Um, and so coming back and, and seeing you talking about like the videos and, and uh, the information war, uh, coming back and seeing that and seeing it succeed with a lot of people. And then, you know, and I've been allowed myself to be pulled into arguments online and I shouldn't, but it's just so frustrating because I'm like, you know, I'm telling you as a individual who was there, you know, who uh, who saw civilian infrastructure get hit, who pulled dead civilians out of cars. Uh, you know, I, I've seen it. I've been a part of it. And the Ukrainians I served next to the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, probably maybe one or two thousand Ukrainians I interacted with across these eight months, Ukrainian men that are fighting. They're not out there committing the war crimes. They're not out there just randomly shooting up civilians. They're not out there uh shooting uh civilian houses and stuff you know they're fighting where they have to fight and they're they're playing defense they're defending themselves but they're out there doing this stuff you know they're not the mm -hmm. ones popping white white phosphor over troops you know i've sat under white phosphor it's miserable and uh they're not the ones doing this uh russians are and i've seen that firsthand i've witnessed it. i'm not a result of the west propaganda i'm a result of having lived there and been there and seen it and been a part of it and talked to the people who live there. I didn't talk to the politicians. I didn't talk to Zelensky. I didn't talk to uh, the, the Western uh, politicians. I talked to the people who lived it, ate it, breathed it, slept it for, you know, since 2014, I talked to these people and they hate Russia with a passion. And that's the stuff that infuriates me so much is with this information push and this misinformation out there, uh, you know, is people are falling pray to it and they're listening and they think all oh, because the person i don't like supports ukraine then i can't support ukraine ukraine must be corrupt yes ukraine's corrupt every country on earth is corrupt there is no country that's uh, not without corruption but if corruption justifies uh, an invasion and murder of innocent civilians and the populace uh, then we're all in for uh, very 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 bad judgment the usa being number one and when that does happen these people who are crying out about corruption in ukraine better sit on their couch and do absolutely nothing no, it's understandable, and it's this these first hand experiences. I think there is a certain detachment. I, th I think this is the same for. I think we spoke about before, Dom, in terms of like if you were to take, for example, I'm trying to think of what other conflicts. If you were to take Syria, for example, or if you were to take, um, I'm trying to think Libya or, or any other recent conflict that wasn't essentially a Western country. I think, uh, what we're trying to say, there's there's more detachment from that situation and it's easier for people to say this is the bad guy and this is what it is, whereas a conflict like this is a lot more polarising because there's so many viewpoints and people see it as a Western civilization that's meant to be held to a different standard. Does that make sense? Um, mm. So it's a bit more polarising in terms of like, um, like bipartisan. So it seems to seems to be either side and do you find from an american point of view and who you've spoken back do you think 
there is a, a mixture of support or do you think it's very much um, one-sided? So looking at the war in Ukraine and looking at the way that it has polarized people, um, you have one side claiming that it's the West and NATO. Uh, and then you have the other side saying, you know, it's, it's simply an invasion of Russia. It, it's Russia. Um, so uh, a lot of people that I've talked to here in the U.S., uh, it's really a mixture. Um, you know, I've been welcomed home by people with open arms and I've been welcomed home by people who say I had no business there. I'm nothing but a, uh, Nazi a Hitler supporting, uh, scumbag, uh, who went over there or someone else say I was fighting for Joe Biden and his son's crooked money in Ukraine. Um, and then I've had people, I, I had a Marine. I was at a, uh, a motorcycle club, uh, meet up, uh, with the Leathernecks, Leathernecks MC here in the U S and, um, I happen to be the youngest Marine for the Marine Corps birthday in, on November 10th. And so I got to, you know, cut the cake. They cut the cake, present it to the youngest Marine, the oldest Marine, which is part of our tradition. And the oldest Marine, ironically, had served in Moscow in like 1970. And me being the youngest Marine, I just came back from fighting uh, Russians. And he was telling me that a lot of the brass he had served with, the young brass, like the young commanders, they're probably the old commanders there now. So I'd fought against them. And he was very thankful because he hated the Russians. He hated everything he experienced while he was there in the 70s. And so it's really been a mixture from my perspective uh, of these viewpoints. Um, you know, and and it's just a, a lot of people allow, especially here in the U.S., politics play a huge part in everyone's decision about anything. Uh, you know, if if I'm a Republican and I don't like Joe Biden and Joe Biden says he likes Dr. Pepper, or Coca-Cola, I'll never drink Coca-Cola again. Or if I'm a Democrat and Donald Trump or the Republican Party says that they like grape soda, then I'm never going to drink grape soda again. It must be terrible. It's evil, you know. And this plays out across every decision that most Americans make is uh, how does their party feel about it? Uh, mm. What does this conspiracy theory say about it from either side? And so I have seen that repeatedly. Uh, there is a huge division about Ukraine in the U.S. Um, and there's a lot of people who feel sorry for Ukraine, uh, but they don't think that we should be sending them money. Even though they don't understand we're not sending them pallets of cash, we're sending them old, outdated equipment we either don't use, we don't need, or we have surplus of uh, stuff that's already been paid for by taxes. Um, and they get upset about this stuff repeatedly. They find a reason to get upset. Um, and then you have people who support Ukraine. So I really can't say that uh, the U.S. is one way or the other, uh, but I can say that it definitely is mixed. Uh, it's it's a mixed viewpoint uh, about Ukraine, um, and the longer the war goes on, uh, the less support I am seeing for Ukraine. Yeah, that's strange. I just find it strange. Or like, well, maybe it's not strange. It's just something to note. Is I think in the UK, I've seen a few polls, and people who speak to generally, it's kind of universal. Both sides, like both political parties, both main political parties, kind of universal in the UK support for. I don't know why support for Ukraine is pretty much. I think it's like eighty percent of the population support the government. Supporting Ukraine, it's strange that America is different, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, I, I've I've seen that uh, in in Europe. I've I've especially saw that. I visited London, and I got to meet with a lot of people there uh, who were considered, I guess, bipartisan uh, that supported Ukraine. And there is bipartisan support here for Ukraine. Uh, however, when you get down to uh, probably the breaking it down to percentages, uh, there's no way eighty percent of the U.S. supports Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and, and it's interesting, too, because especially on the right wing, I come from a right wing family, a conservative family. And um, once again, reiterate, and I'm not liberal, I'm not conservative, I'm not, I'm not Republican, I'm not Democrat. I hate both sides equally. Um, but a lot of these, a lot of what I've seen with Republicans is they cry out all the time, oh, you know, Joe Biden's a communist or the Democrats are communists. And they're yeah. not. Um, but you look at Russia who is led by a KGB agent who is a card-carrying communist, their economy is not communist, but their mindset is, their, their belief system is communist, what they're built upon is communism. Uh, you know, what they want to bring back is the USSR, which was communist. The second uh, largest party in Russia is the communist party in Russia. Um, and, and you look at these factors here, and it's like literal communism slapping uh conservatives and republicans in the face here in the u.s and they're sitting here going uh i don't see anything you know russia just wants to protect traditionalist values well that's nice to know after the 
two guys got caught blowing each other in that trench. The Russian guys had a grenade dropped yeah. on them. You know, those are some traditionalist values right there that Russia's fighting for. And these are Russian guys, uh, you know, but uh, the the ignorance, uh, the lack of research uh, will definitely help Russia in their fight to win the uh, information war, because most people, the majority of people, you know, me and you, we might say if we were not attached to the war in any personal way, we might would do some research. We might would delve in hours and hours and hours for, you know, two or three months and, and read up about what's going on and who's who and what the players are. Uh, but these guys, they see a clip of somebody, a video of somebody who's well-dressed and has a good manner of speaking, and they go, oh, that guy's telling the truth. That's the point of view I'm going to stand <laughs> by. Uh, and so if, uh, with as ignorant as a lot of Americans are, if Russia continues uh, with their, uh, in the information war, they will win it against the, the average American citizen. As you yeah. think, I think, surely from like, We've discussed this a bit in terms like the boogeyman, the natural enemy or the only known na known natural predator of the American right is pretty much Russia. You should, you, you would think that is like the natural thing they would be against just because they're Russian. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I it, it would make sense. Um, and of course, we sided with uh, the Soviet Union, um, and uh, I really think we should have fought both sides. I think we should have fought the Soviet Union and we should have fought the Nazis because uh, all of them suck. Uh, but uh, a lot of people have had problems with Russia over the years, but with the information war and what's presented to people now, uh, they have this idea that uh, Russia is a hero country invading a much smaller country uh, to save its own country, even though it's like, <laughs> what, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and uh, people are just, people are misguided. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to, to, to misguide people, it's it's easy to to lie to them and get them to believe something. Um, if you present yourself in a certain way and you're able to control the information that they receive, and uh, with the amount of money that Russia has put in over the years in multiple countries uh, concerning information, they know how to play the game regarding information and what information is presented. And uh, I mean, and then again, people once again going back to and I'm sorry, I'm ranting a little bit, but going back to uh, people lack of research. You know, you look at what happened in Georgia in 2008. Um, you know, you look at the attempted overturn of the Belarusian Lukashenko uh, in 2020, where an election legitimately was stolen uh, and, and they failed to overturn it. And I served next to some great Belarusian guys who the sole purpose of them being in Ukraine was hoping Belarus would cross the border so they could fight Lukashenko. That's the only reason they were there in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at these, Russia doesn't have a good track record at all, looking at what they've done in Syria, you know, and but people don't people don't look at the facts. The, once again, they, they look at something the way it's presented to them and it's presented to cater to to their uh, either traditional beliefs or their uh, anti fascist beliefs. Um, and they get this idea that, uh, oh, well, Russia is just this great country standing up for either traditionalism or standing against Nazis, which appeals to both ends of the American people. Uh, the, Russia standing up against Nazis appeals to the left, and Russia standing up for traditionalistic values appeals to the right wing. And so with the information war, it's very, it's very successful because of that. Yeah. I think this a lot seems... of people, Sorry, I think in, in general, I think, I, I think this anyway, a lot, a lot of people form an opinion about something, it doesn't really matter what it is, but usually the more important it is, the more, more like intense their opinion is. They form an opinion and then they're presented with information that might go against that opinion. They generally ignore it. Mm -hmm. They ignore the information that doesn't support their opinion. And then any information that does support their opinion, they'll hold it up and go, yeah, look, this proves my opinion is correct or my viewpoint is correct. And I think it's just like a, it's endemic in the West and probably the rest of the world as well at the moment, it just seems. And that's, 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 that's one, of, one of the things I, uh, when I went to Ukraine is, uh, I wasn't sold 100% either direction. I wanted to go and help people. Um, mm -hmm. And when I got there, it's when I became sold on what was really going on and I formulated 100% my concrete opinion. Uh, but people, you know, people, people aren't going to do that. And I have a solution to fix all of this. I just <laughs> pray to God every night that Russia invades the US. I wish they would. <laughs> they would get smoked before they could even get off their boats on our West Coast. And by the time they even hit the coast, Everybody be coming out of the nightclub shooting them up. The boys on the East Coast would hit them within two days. We'd be across the East Coast, you know, mag dumping into Russians and blowing them up with homemade 
uh, explosive <laughs> devices. Uh, and this would solve all of this. All Russia has to do is get ballsy yeah. enough to really, you know, if they if Russia claims they're fighting America in Ukraine, then come fight America on American soil. If you really think you're ballsy enough to fight Russia, to fight the U.S. in Ukraine, if that's your set of balls, then actually grow a pair and come to the homeland. And I'm, a, I'm 100 percent serious about it. You know, I've seen war. I don't want war. I don't want the devastation that goes with it. But neither do I want Russia to continue existing as a country. I'm completely for the annihilation of the Russian government and the Russian military. Do you think, do you think Russia miscalculated the support that the West, like America and other countries had for Ukraine? Do you think they, they didn't really realize how much support they were willing to provide? I think that they miscalculated a lot of things because uh, the, Western, the Western support is not what stopped Russia from conquering Kiev in three days. It was Ukrainians fighting every inch of the way for their homeland and their families and their children. Russia entered a country uh, where every male got armed. And we're not talking where Russia entered a country that had already uh, that had a NATO presence like Syria and they were able to work and, and fight, you know, there. They entered a country that fought them every inch of the way. And uh, boys were out there, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, uh, running in waves at Russians and getting mowed down by machine guns, just like World War One and gaining ground and fighting back and pushing back. That's what they underestimated. I do believe that they did underestimate the Western support, but uh, and that has played a huge part in saving Ukraine. Uh, but the major part that has been played here is uh, the Ukrainian uh, people and their resilience and their desire and their hatred uh, for any country invading their land. They fought back just like if the U.S. was invaded or I'm sure either one of your countries were invaded. We would fight. I, I believe that 100 percent. I would fight until I am dead. I would fight for my country. I don't like my country's politics. I don't like where it stands, but this is my country. This is my family. And I will go out there and I will die. And I will bring every person with me to die with me until that invader leaves my land. And that's the way Ukrainians look at this. They have a sense of pride. They have a sense of uh, belonging in Ukraine. They have a sense of being separate from Russia, you know, really being separate mm -hmm. since I believe it was 1994, you know, and this has been steadily sown, you know, being separate from Russia, being independent from Russia, not living under the USSR, not being, uh, you know, famines being made against you by Russia or being exiled to Serbia by Russia, being sent off, shipped off. These people have an identity now and they're fighting to keep that identity separate from Russia. And that's what Russia underestimated. I don't believe uh, that Western support has stopped Russia. I don't believe that's what stopped Russia. I think it's helped. But I think the majority is Ukrainians fighting every inch of the way. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that's in terms of, do you think that's translating massively into the terms of the units and the amount of people that are volunteering for um, outside of conscription? Is it a, is it a massive, except from the beginning, obviously more towards the end as this conscriptions came in, was there also a, a, a big mass of volunteers as well continuing to, to sign up? As, as far as Ukraine goes, yeah. A lot of the guys that I served with um, and a lot of the guys that I interacted with were sh strictly volunteers. Uh, they went on the first day. They didn't care about getting a paycheck. Um, there are some guys I met in 207 Territorial Defense, great gentlemen. Um, they were uh, participated uh, fighting for Kiev, and they didn't care about a paycheck. They left their home. They went down. They got a gun, and they went out to fight. They didn't care. Um, and that happened repeatedly, uh, and it's still happening, of, of boys saying, okay, I've had enough. I'm going to go fight. I'm not conscripted. There were a lot of males uh, that were protected from this conscription because they were in college or university uh, further in their education. They were protected from the conscription that left that and went and served uh, because it's their country. And I've, I've seen that across the board in Ukraine. And I believe it's uh, Bill 9801 that was introduced to the Ukrainian. Uh, it, it may have already been passed by now, but basically it's saying, you know, during martial law, no conscription, blah, blah, blah. Um, Ukraine doesn't have a need for conscription now. Ukraine is, is not going to have to force people to fight for them. Uh, there are so many, so many, so many Ukrainians I've served with across the northern and eastern front uh, that they will continue to fight. When their one year is up, they will keep fighting. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't come in. And I, I served with people that in the early days, they hadn't even signed no contract. They had no commitment. They were just there for their homeland. And that type of spirit was repeated across the front line. Uh, in Ukraine. And I, I think it will continue to be that way until Russia is pushed out of Ukraine.
Yeah, it's one of, another one of the kind of talking points you had early on in the war was that like people trying to like say that Ukraine wasn't a real country or Ukraine didn't like it's just a made up country and all this stuff. They have no national identity. It was like I don't know what the crap that is if it's true or not, but like it seems like now if they didn't have them before, they definitely have a national identity and a, a unity now. If they didn't before, I don't know, they probably did before, mm. but they're now they seem like they're pretty united and um, seem like a real country now. They're all fighting together. Yeah, well, Ukraine has definitely struggled to hold its head up uh, for years, um, years and years and years, hundreds of years. Um, and then we look after 1994, uh, Ukraine started making progress and then it was reset. Uh, and then Russian controlled uh, politicians were put into place in Ukraine. And then in 2014, uh, all of that changed. Um, and regardless of whether that was Western money that influenced that or not, it changed for the Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. And they kind of had to restart and start again uh, as Ukraine. Um, and then you look at like with Zelensky, uh, and once again, I'm, I'm not, I don't really agree with some of his political viewpoints or nothing like that, or some of the way he does things, but he came out of nothing. And a lot of the people that I've talked to in Ukraine, now I've met people in Ukraine that they don't like Zelensky, but they're not fighting for him. They're fighting for Ukraine. And, but a lot of the ones I met, they like him. They don't like his politics, but he stayed there. When I was in Kyiv, and Kyiv was in the process of almost being surrounded, uh, the man on the street with his bodyguard was Zelensky. You know, he wasn't hiding away. He was there knowing that these guys are going to kill him if they take Kyiv, and he was there. And a lot of people across Ukraine look at that, and they kind of identify with that because it, it helps showcase the, the resilience and dedication of the Ukrainian spirit and the rejection of Russian control and uh, oppression. And so looking at that, um, I think that now uh, Ukraine will always have that identity. Uh, they had it before, but it wasn't showcased like it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Ukraine will always, for hit all of history, these, these moments will be remembered, whether it starts a world war, whether it ends with Russia withdrawing, or whether, unfortunately, if it happens, it ends with Russia taking the land that it wants. Ukraine will always be remembered for the fierce stand that it made against the Russians and the Ukrainian boys and the, the, the volunteers, the international volunteers who went there out of dedication to morality, uh, a feeling of, of morality, went there and fought and died and spilled their blood to stop Russian oppression. They'll always be remembered through history. So in the end, Ukraine has already won. No, it's poignant, mate. Very poignant. Um, so in, in terms of Come back to like the general operations you day to day in terms of communication with the ukrainians i can imagine i've seen some of the videos the guys try to communicate with their ukrainian counterparts what is it like on a day to day is it, is it generally quite hard so it really depends on where you're at and what you're doing uh if you're going out to do like a, a anti-tank mission you're usually rolling with english-speaking dudes uh, our command was english-speaking um so it, it worked worked out well. If you're going to go sit in a trench and you're going to sit under Artie and you're going to mix with Ukrainians, uh, you know, you are you get pushed out of a trench line into part of a village and you're mixing with other Ukrainians and you're trying to identify yourself as friendly or you're trying to communicate with them so you can move together, work together. Or for instance, uh, uh, Ukrainians that had been killed and part of their uh, group attached themselves to us. Uh, usually you'll always find, especially among the youth, you'll always find a Ukrainian who speaks enough English to get it done. Mm -hmm. um but at the same note like all a lot of us studied ukrainian and we were trying to learn different words that uh we needed on the battlefield or phrases or things like that uh that that would help us out uh it i didn't really see it as much of an issue um we generally always had a translator serving with us especially in when i was in the Ivan bohuna brigade uh everybody was uh, every group had a translator. We had a translator. We had someone who could speak Ukrainian and Russian and English. Um, so we never really had to worry about that. Um, and so I didn't really have that much of an issue with it. Um, and generally you point enough and make enough signals, someone's going to understand <laughs> you. Uh, so, I mean, we got it done and, uh, you know, it, 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 it worked. So I, it could be an issue at times, but it wasn't really that prevalent of an issue. The issue was the artillery. It wasn't the, wasn't the yeah. language. <laughs> it, was, it was actually being able to hear each other over the artillery. Yeah, I can imagine. Was there, was there any instances where it was an identification issue and you've had to shout Amerikansky about a million times to get someone to stop? Uh, most of the time, you know, if there was any type of identification happening, 
uh, we were saying we were, you know, a Maritakonsky or Yaw Maritakonsky and uh, mm. we had American flag patches home. Huh. And uh, if anyone ever pushed even further than that, it was just sim- as simple as pulling out like your green book or your identification and saying, you know, here you go. Um, or identifying what unit you were with, but we didn't really have we didn't really have identification issues either because when you're put in a position and they say Russians are that way, Ukrainians are behind you. What you know? What more do you need at that point? Uh, <laughs> if someone if someone comes towards you, you're going to shoot them. Uh, if already comes into your position, you're not identifying yourself to the shells coming in. So like you know, it <laughs> it doesn't at that point it doesn't really matter. It's just uh, you know, and if you have to withdraw from the position. Um, depending upon how your chain of command is, if you've got a good command, they've already let uh, the unit behind you know, hey, I got guys coming back. Um, this are the type of uniforms they're going to be in. Uh, you know, don't shoot them. Uh, or they already knew. Or during that time, you sit somebody back to talk to the unit behind you and establish comms between the two of you. Uh, and when I say unit, I use that term loosely. It could be four guys behind you. It could be 100. Mm. Um, but always try to establish communication. Uh, with with those those groups around you and and sometimes it didn't work but um, I've only been in a friendly fire situation twice uh, so you know and that's out of probably a total of I don't know six thirty probably a hundred and fifty or hundred and sixty days on the front line uh, actually more than that probably hundred and eighty total days uh, friendly fire twice well it's not such a, a- Something I, I always look at and think, how how do you tell a friend from foe? It looks crazy, but obviously it's not because obviously the uniforms are similar enough. Like compared to obviously we're used to a dude in a dish stash in Afghan or whatever versus a guy in MTP or multicam. Mm. So obviously there's not big an issue as it seems like in videos or, or media in general. Um, well, I never really, I, I never really had any problem identifying them um, okay, right. for the most part. I mean. Ukraine obviously has its uniform. Russia has its. Uh, sometimes they look a little similar. And like, for instance, yellow tape. Ukrainians were wearing yellow tape. Russians were wearing white. But yellow tape looks white at night. At distance um, as well, yeah. You know, so there, there are little little things like that. But most of the time, if your job is, hey, you're holding this part of the village, uh, you have some Ukrainians in front of you, and there's Russians in front of them, or you have Russians pushing towards you, uh, it'll it's going to sort itself out. It's really not like... You're just shooting everybody, and oh man, I killed Ukrainian soldiers. Oh, what am I? That didn't really happen often, mm. or at all. I probably should say at all. I probably shouldn't say the word often. Often, <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I never, I never witnessed any unit I was a part of, uh, you know, opening fire on somebody that yeah, was friendly. Yeah. Right, yeah, uh, there yeah. have been some, you know, some moments where it's like, oh, oh, you know, trying to figure out, uh, but it usually sorts itself out. Uh, mm. Now, I have been fired on by friendly forces. I've had that happen. Um, we were, me and my buddy Mac were standing next to, uh, they have like these 10 very, very, very thin metal fences in Ukraine. And they're painted green a lot of times. And we were standing there. We had got some wounded out of the, out of the position we were in. It was a bad situation. And we're standing there talking, trying to catch up with each other before he went back to his uh, position. And I went to handle some other stuff. And down the road in a straight stretch, uh, we, there was Ukrainians there. We knew there were Ukrainians holed up in that position. And all of a sudden, someone opened fire on us, and they put like seven or eight rounds through the fence right next to us. And uh, he's coming across the radio like, tell them we're friendly. He's like, quit shooting at us. And after like maybe five minutes of them taking pot shots at us every time we popped our head out, they finally stopped. And then we were able to make that connection be like, hey, guys, like, we're we're friendly. We're foreigners. We're here to help, you know, you know. Uh, Things like that. Um, but the majority of the time, someone starts shooting at us, you just return fire and uh, won't really. Uh, and that, that also didn't happen a lot. A lot of people don't understand. Like in Ukraine, once again, going back to these videos that people post, um, I've been in, I'm not showing the exact count of firefights, but it's not a lot, you know, in comparison to the amount of time there. The amount of time there is spent sitting under artillery or helicopter fire. Um, or a jet flying over and buzzing you every once a day, dropping some little bombs. I don't know what they're called, but they, they hit the ground and wait like three seconds and they explode. And it's like mm. carpet bombs everywhere. Uh, I don't like those things. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of braving artillery and fighting tanks, uh, getting shot at by tanks and trying to you know maneuver around on it and pop it with an in-law. 
uh, as compared to, you know, you're throwing down with someone in the street or you're mm-hmm. trying to out position someone in a tree line. It does happen. Um, but it's not as common an occurrence as people think, you know, like, hey, you're going to go kick in a door and shoot somebody. Uh, it's you're going to sit under Artie for 14, 15 days. Russians are going to make a push. You're going to get your firefight. You're going to see a couple of them. Maybe, possibly, uh, they're going to get pushed back and retreat like the cowards that they are because their infantry can't handle our infantry. And then you're going to go back to sitting under artillery. And is that often, are you finding that's their main push? It's just heavy artillery, sanitized area, and then just push through with, but with infantry and APCs? Yeah, I, and and like Wagner, for instance, I fought Wagner three times, and then their infantry's trash. I don't even know why they got a good name. Like, we smoked them so many times, infantry on infantry. They're, you know, in those three times, we smoked so many of them, infantry on infantry. They should never, well, the ones we smoked will never hold their heads up with pride again, that's for sure. Um but they're complete trash and the only thing that they relied on is their artillery and their armor so like when you have a position of a hundred a hundred men and you sit there and already it for a month and a half two months straight and that position hasn't had a rotation out and there's 30 men left um then you make a push you know and and doing that repeatedly it's the only reason they've made headway anywhere and it's the reason they lost a lot of ground when there was an offensive push by the Ukrainian military because they just can't they can't they can't stand up against it. We look at Bakhmut and uh, what happens at Bakhmut, and I was between Bakhmut and the Russian forces that were trying to take Bakhmut, which is Wagner Group, um, and fighting there. Their infantry is complete trash. You smoke infantry anytime you wanted to. If they ever had the balls enough to show their faces and come fight you, it was it was a happy day. It's like, ah, we're gonna kill we're gonna kill infantry. Like it's whatever. We don't care. It's simple. We probably won't even lose anybody. It's going to be a fun day. But then you just sit under their arty again and again and again and again. Um, and it's tactics. And I get like it's smart, but it's also stupid because eventually either, which I know everyone's like, oh, well, they got two years of supplies, but still their supply line is going to get hit or eventually they're going to run out or their gun's going to cool, uh, get hot and they got to let it cool down or, you know, uh, the mortar's not going to work properly. Uh, and you push them with infantry and vehicles, they they can't take it. Uh, uh, they might be able to hold because they've dug in for three or four months, but you start really pushing them, they, j- they just can't take it. And if they push you with infantry and you've got fresh guys in the position, they stand no chance. And so that's what they resort to doing is artillery. And that's what the war mostly is. It's just arty, 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 or some tank waiting to hit you on the road. They use tanks against infantry all the time there. And, uh, you know, they're terrible shots, though, but... <laughs> it's yeah. Russian Russian doctrine in a nutshell, isn't it? Artillery. Um and in terms you're talking about the defences and that, in terms of the command, what is the command like Ukrainian military wise in terms of positioning and just command structure throughout? Is it are they generally good? Is there experience there? <laughs> it's uh <laughs> it's like it's like playing roulette. You go to a new position or a new unit. Uh, you roll the dice and you really, you, or uh, you, of course you don't roll the dice and you roulette. You fu- you spin the wheel, you throw a ball, <laughs> and you see what you're going to get. Um, it's I've had some really terrible commanders. I actually uh, I had my pistol taken away in Ukraine for a month because I pointed it at a Ukrainian commander. Um, you know, there's uh, situations like that. They're just they're terrible. Uh, they have no training. They've been placed there because they either bought a place or they knew somebody. Uh, mm. when the invasion happened and so they kind of got booted up into a command position um and you have other commanders who are their balls to the wall they want to die for their country i don't want to die for ukraine i didn't go over there wanting to die for ukraine i wanted to kill for ukraine but you meet some ukrainian commanders who they they that's the end of their life they're 55 60 years old they think this is it for them they're going to command and they're going to get all their glory and they're going to die and some of those are bad commanders to serve under you'll get put in bad positions uh You'll get, they'll come down and they'll say, hey, you have a, you're on a anti-tank mission, so you're going to this position. You're going to sit in this bunker, and if the tank comes down, tanks come down that road, generally they travel in groups of three. You have one in-law and one RPG. News flash, you're not going to knock out a tank with an RPG unless you can get behind it with an anti-tank round and get within like 150 meters. Um, everyone's like, all oh, the anti-tank rounds can fly 300 meters. Sure, you floated on in there like a basketball, because I'm not. <laughs> um, but... Uh, you have commanders and you're going to sit in this bunker 
We'll call you when the tanks come down. Then you're going to run 100 meters across an open field and get into that tree line there, face the tank, hit the tank with your one in law. Mind you, there's three tanks. And then you're going to exfil 400 meters across the open field behind that little tree line. <laughs> and I'm sitting here like, what? It's you know, fun. like, and, and regardless of the fact that there's not much equipment, but there were some uh, strategies that were presented that were just miserable. Um, and it was just, uh, but then there was other times, you know, it was great command, uh, great, great commanders, uh, good orders. Uh, hellish places to fight but uh if you had a good command system at your back like you knew uh if we get surrounded they're going to do everything in their power to get us out um and if we get killed they're going to come get our bodies uh then there was other commands i had one command we're sitting in uh we're on a rotation in zaitseva and we find out that our our commander company commander they had just up and left the village you know they called, said that we were practically surrounded, and they had just up and left, like pulled stakes. They didn't even tell us. They just, we found out like two hours later. Uh, we had Ukrainian guys with us. Their commander hadn't talked to them in two days, um, just up and dipped. Uh, and when I got when I got back into Bakhmut after that, I met with a Ukrainian commander who deserted his guys there, left them hanging, didn't talk to them for two days, didn't make sure they had food and water, didn't come in and help them, didn't try to medevac their wounded, uh, nothing. And I handed him an AK that actually it was an RPK, and an RPK that was completely blood soaked, still had body parts on it, like little chunks. I handed it to this man, and I said, "This is your fault. You know, th this is because of you." So you did get command like that. That was just atrocious. But you also had good ones. So mm. yeah, I don't think that's specific to the Ukrainian military. I think that's th yeah. you get that in most. It's just at different levels, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, so. It's, so in terms of the units you served in, I know you say quite a few there, what was the, the main ones and what were the differences in terms of what you did? So the main ones that I was a part of uh, was the Yvonne Bohona Special Purpose Brigade. Um, that was a little more high speed. Uh, I'd say probably a little more hellish, but I also served with them longer, a lot longer than any other unit. Um, I was also part of the 207 TDF. I got to do a lot of training with them and help them out uh, in the early days. And then I worked with a group known as Task Force 10. It's an American group that was there in March. Uh, and they were, it was one of those situations. We we actually took part uh, with the 119th Brigade, helped back them up, uh, doing a lot of exfil stuff. Um, and it, it was pretty rough. Probably, I'd say March was probably, it was close to the roughest month um, as in terms of, uh, the amount of of death uh, in the units around us, um, but the Ivan Bohuna uh, Brigade, uh, which I don't really recommend for anyone, the Channing Command has just gotten so out of hand now there. Um, but that was probably the most action. Um, it was steady, uh, and it was. I mean, it was tough. We, we, our our company developed a. Um, patch that said per rectum ad rectum, um, which if you translate those words, I'm sure you know what it means, but per rectum ad rectum, uh, you know, it's basically like from crap to crap or something like that. Um, and uh, that's what we did. Uh, we got put in the part of lines that no one else wanted. Nobody wanted to hold. No one thought it was possible to hold. Uh, that was our job uh, with them. And so I'd say that uh, I got the most experience with them. Um, but thought the I had the worst worst time uh, with with them and lost I I lost my most friends with them. Um, uh, if that answers your question, I think that, that basically that unit was getting sent to like places in need of like like um what's the word um so basically it was like any any unit that was in crisis you were kind of went to plug a gap. Is that is that why yeah you, that, why, yeah. Why, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that would so be a good you, way to put it. You're kind of always getting deployed to crisis spots or spots that are about to crumble, kind of. Yeah. Where I'm thinking that. Well, yeah. Ivan Bohuna uh, deployed to Lahansk, uh and withdrew from Lahansk after being surrounded. They had been surrounded and were able to push through and withdraw. So that gives you an example of that. Lost Luhansk. Um, and now, when I state these losses, 
I'm going to try to cut it enough so Russian propaganda can't use it and be like, oh, you know, Ukraine's losing. Yeah, Ukraine lost a couple of battles here and there. Newsflash. We mm-hmm. stomped a lot of Russians into the ground while we were doing it, though. Um, but Luhansk, lost Luhansk with Ivan Bohuna, withdrew from Luhansk, uh, fought in Gogorivka outside of Sibirsk, um, lost that place uh, to Russians. Um, very, very bad situation there. Um, lost a lot of guys there. Uh, and then fought in Zaitseva and Bakhmut. Uh, and lost sights of a, to the Russians. Um, you know, you have a lot of these guys, they post these videos and they talk about, you know, they helped liberate this place. They helped, we didn't do any liberating. Uh, the only thing we liberated was Russian orcs from their masters by yeeting them. Um, the majority of the time, the the three places with Ivan Bohona uh, that we deployed to, we lost. Uh, but we did a lot of killing while doing that, while losing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we got to be in a couple more firefights because we were the ones that were, um, you know, receiving the assault and uh, holding ground. Um, and as a matter of fact, those positions, other than Luhansk, uh, those those two positions were not lost until after we had been withdrawn from that uh, situation. Uh, uh, but those were the positions we were in, and that's the type of heat we were taking. I mean, looking at like Gogodovka, for instance, we were taking over 500 shells a day uh, day after day after day after day after day. That's what we were sitting under and holding ourselves under, waiting for that time when the Russians push and we'd go fight, we push them back, we'd go fight, we push them back. Um, and so that being our, our sole job, we really got some some pretty tough places. But, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'll, I'm alive and some of my friends ain't, but a lot of Russians ain't either. Uh, it's the price that's paid for it. And, uh, you know, um, I'll uh, I'll trash talk Russians and especially Wagner Group until the day I die. I even got a tattoo specifically for Wagner right here. Um, you know, this little shout out for Wagner Group right there. It says Murphy Katsapi. That means the dead butchers. And, uh, you know, that's what I think of Wagner. Uh, I got a couple of their patches, some ID cards, some odds and ends from them. They're a great group to collect off of. Uh, and they're complete trash. <laughs> so in terms yeah. of, so I know you, you spoke about Wagner and then you spoke about in terms of who is it you've faced specifically? So Wagner, I'm assuming DPR um, would it be a group or has it been uh, Russian regulars? Well, so in the early days, it was some Russian regulars, maybe some Russian SF, don't know, didn't really stop to talk to many of them. Um, and then in the Eastern regions, uh, outside of Gogodovka in Gogodovka and Siversk area, and then in Bakhmu, it was Wagner Group, um, and in the Luhansk region, and also uh, in the Siversk area uh, was the DPR, which I have like some passports from those guys, uh, uh, separatists or whatever that were fighting for Russia. Um, they didn't need their passports anymore, so I took them. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, pretty much. Um, didn't really, didn't really see a lot of regular Russian kids out there that you know are fighting for Russia. Um, there's probably a couple here and there, uh, the ones that I, I was able to check and take stuff from, uh, and yeah, try me for a war crime. I don't care. I took trophies from them. I don't care. Um, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, Wagner group, Wagner PMC and, uh, some DPR guys. Yeah. I suppose that seems to be quite a common thing. You're saying about the war crimes and that, but it's like, I think that's prolific throughout the whole war. I think both sides are pretty much doing that. There's no, like, I don't think it's really frowned upon yeah, every, in terms every, of what people are collecting. Nah. Every, everyone's everyone's taking stuff from everybody. Their side takes stuff from us, you know, trophies from the dead, and, and you know, our side takes it from them. And uh, But then again, it's not a war. It's a special military operation, so the Geneva <laughs> Convention might not apply. Uh, okay. But, I, you know, I, I will say that if there's ever a Geneva Convention 2.0, uh, uh, well, I'll leave that joke for another time. I'll leave that joke for another time. <laughs> yeah. Probably gonna leave a joke for saying that. Yeah, no, I have no, really. I have no respect for Russian pigs. I have no respect <laughs> for people invading someone else's homeland and killing their people and being a part of it. And some of the Russians we interacted with, and some of the Russians that one of the units I worked with had captured. Uh, you know, you see these videos of these people saying, "Oh, well, there's Russians. They don't want to be there." Yeah, there might be one or two that don't want to be there. But there's a lot of them that we interacted with. There are POWs that they hated Ukrainians. They they wanted an ethnic cleansing of Ukraine. And so looking at that, I don't really care. They're here. And uh, yeah, so 
uh, I hate him and I'll continue to hate him. <laughs> That's fair. It's, um, it is, is, do you think this is something held purely, maybe this might be, was this Russian regulars you're talking about, the ones that hated Ukrainians, or was this just like DPR volunteers? Uh, th- we never captured any DPR volunteers. Uh, there was a couple Wagner guys, and then maybe like two Russian regulars. I'd have to go back. I've got all my stuff put into notes and files mm. about different things, um, analyzed and all that. I'd have to go back and look at that thoroughly to be able to give you an accurate answer for that. Nice. Um, but, uh, and then some of our neighboring units that were a part of uh, capturing these guys, uh, I remember one unit next to us that picked up some Russian regulars, to my knowledge, and they they hated Ukrainians like they were there because they hated Ukrainians. Um, so, uh, I mean, you might have that one or two that gets propagandized and everyone's like, oh, they, you know, they're just 18 year old boys. They're being sent away from home. And yes, some of them are. Uh, but, you know, there's really no there's no, not really any excuse for them. when you get on the front line. If the majority of the Russians sent to Ukraine did not want to be in Ukraine, there would be no war in Ukraine. It would all be sorted out to other countries and paid for. You know, they might send in North Korean troops or something. Uh, When you have maybe a million troops in in a country, if the majority of them didn't want to be there, they would easily turn it around and not be there. You know, it's very simple to get rid of your command on the front line if you need to. not saying that's ever happened on the Ukrainian side, but if it were to happen, it's a very simple process. And if these guys didn't really want to be there fighting, they wouldn't be there. Point blank period. I think it was um and I think Nick made this point as well. There was like there was there was two groups. There was like the blind ones who didn't know when they were going in. But the majority of people are just they're just professional soldiers, I think most of the Russian regulars, and they're just they're indifferent. They're either they're, they're like most soldiers are, they're there to fight. But most of them just want to go home because it's tend to, it's what you tend to want to do when you're at war, aren't you? So I think it's very much a case of that, like we were saying. And I say I think I say this everybody podcast we have, when Willie said that he was like, if any any conventional army, and they said, like, for example, US Marine Corps, and they said, right, we're going to go invade Mexico. 90% of the guys would be like, okay, we'll go, let's, let's go, just because they're like, yeah, like they're fighting why, force. but we're going to go do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and that makes sense. And I definitely think that's a... Uh, I, I think that uh, they're there because they have the orders. But if they really chose not to be there, they wouldn't be there. You know, mm. if they really, if the majority of them really did not want to be there, you know. But like you said, that is, they're doing their job. They're doing what they're told to do. They're doing, they're following their orders. They feel it's for their country. You know, they're wanting, at this point, when you get to that point, you're wanting to kill the person on the other end. Mm. You know, it doesn't, when, once you get to that point because you're there because of orders or you're there because, oh, you, you, you've been told to go there. Uh, you develop it's 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 Russia. You know, I'm sure they view their country like I view my country. Uh, it's it, it's America. I'm I'm going here because America told me to do it, and they've told me this, and they've told me that, and they've told me this, and they told me that. So, uh, you know, if you're shooting at me, I want to kill you. I want to kill every one of you. I want to kill your family. You know, and so on. And that's the way these guys, are, especially now, are going to end up looking at it. You know, they've been there, and now they want to be a part of it. They want to fight. They want to continue because they know that that's their job. And that's what they're going to identify with. That's understandable. Um, and I just want to touch on, I know you mentioned it before, we're getting on like, we're over an hour and a half now. And I know what it's like, especially when you, you can you can get going, mate. It's, um, I just want to touch on, because you mentioned it before, especially with you being, it's, it's, a, it's a massive stark difference from going, stark what did i just say a stark difference going from what you've done now mate you basically i can see you're sat in like a hotel room or apartment in puerto rico mate what's it been like for you i understand if you don't want to speak about it but i know you've mentioned it slightly before what has it been like in in terms of support and how, how, how are you dealing with um in terms of support i have some some close friends i've been able to confide in um and i haven't really gone this much into detail about service there in uh, Ukraine, as I have talking to you guys. Um, but I studied a lot about middle, a lot about mental health before participating in the war, and um, so I understand that it helps to talk. And even though a lot of times in my heart I really don't want to talk, my head says, "Hey, uh, the knowledge that 
that you have uh, from reading about mental health, it will help. So talk. So a lot of times I'll try to force myself to talk to some of the people around me. Um, and uh, I've got some good friends that I talk to that that listen um, and they're able to to help. But it's not easy. It's, uh, um, you know, it's uh, every day is 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 a process. Um, noises, sounds, things like that are rough to work through. Um, just, just the general, um, just general society and how spoiled we are as a nation and the people around us, you know, if someone complains because gas is half a dollar more a gallon, whoop de whoop, who cares? You have a house to go home to, you're driving a car, you have a job, you're putting food in your mouth, your son's not dying, your kids ain't getting bombed, your apartment building isn't destroyed, your, your home is still standing, you know, and so on. And, and that's been hard to work through and not like snapping at people when i hear them crying and complaining about this stuff uh it's it's uh it's been tough coming home the holidays have been the worst you know and uh just being around people and seeing everyone happy with their families and stuff and knowing you know some of my boys they won't be able to have that uh it's it's been tough uh but i take solace in the fact that um two things one is for for every every boy everybody of mine that was killed in ukraine uh a lot more russians died than than one um and if i go back and they end up getting me uh i've yeeted enough of them it'll be a fair trade-off uh and looking trying to look at it that way in a semi-positive light and that's very sadistic way to look at it but it helps me to know that you know a lot of them bastards ain't home with their families either uh, looking at it that way and then also trying to understand by studying mental health that uh, a good way to look at it is trying to live a fulfilling life for those that mm. can't. Um, yeah. And it's hard. A lot of times I don't feel it here. Here hurts, you know. Um, you know, I'll, I'll wake up at night and I'll see a buddy in my mind. Uh, I'll, 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 hear, I'll hear a voice uh, that's no longer with us and it hurts here. Um, but, you know, reading and trying to understand mental health here says, you know, push on. It's going to be all right. Uh, you know, talk to somebody, uh, confide in somebody. Uh, so coming home has been a, a very tough, but we're working through it. Uh, we're making it happen. Um, and I mean, it's and a lot of my friends are the same way. A lot of my friends who who left the unit when I did, uh, they they went home. Some of them are already going back uh, because they miss it so much. They miss the, the camaraderie or the simplicity of life on their front lines. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is survive and kill whoever comes at you. It's very simple, you know, and uh, a lot of them miss that simplicity. Uh, but I've talked to a lot of them and, and they're having tough times. And it's a war, not like, you know, PTSD is very, uh, it's very different for different people. Some people can have PTSD from childhood trauma. Some people, you know, it's very different. But as a combat veteran, uh, our PTSD comparatively speaking is slightly different than your afghanistan vets ptsd and your iraqi war vets ptsd um because you know a lot of their deployments yeah they might have been nine months 12 months long in a combat zone they got hit by a shell or two some of them got hit by some heavier stuff or they have two or three solid days outside the wire where they got a good firefight with a dude wearing flip-flops once again no disrespect at whatsoever thank you thankful for for these guys, but it's just a whole different war. Mm -hmm. And when you go there and in eight months, you know, you deploy uh, four different separate regions, um, six separate direct deployments, and you sit under this stuff day after day after day after day after day after day, and you're fighting every week. And you're not, uh, you're not just, you know, going out for a day or two and then sitting on a base for several months, you know, or you have you don't have air superiority. It's a whole different uh, mindset that it creates for those that have been through it and survived it. Um, and, and that's one thing I will say about coming home. Like I got welcomed by a lot of combat veterans at home. I have the club I ride for gave me my combat veteran patch and they said, you've earned this, brother. Uh, I had Afghanistan dudes sit down uh, across the table from me and then uh, want to hear war stories and try to like one up me and uh, I'm sitting <laughs> here in my out. head like uh, in my head like I earned my place at the table um, but I, I don't have anything to prove to them I don't have any you know like talk to them I don't have anything to prove to you and uh, my 
combat service and experience and the boys who serve with me there, their experience will hold up against the majority of tier one operators. Uh, most of like in the US, I was talking with a guy the other day, uh, former Delta, a uh, good friend of mine has been for a couple of years. He's in the uh, private side of the military now, private security, um, private military contract and stuff like that. But he was telling me 99% uh, of the SF guys that he's been a part of and, and served with and fought next to in Operation uh, uh, Iraqi Freedom and in Afghanistan, uh, what we saw in three months in Ukraine was more than these guys had been through. And so looking at that, it's hard to address mental health issues because we have the manuals for uh, certain things uh, to a certain extent, but we don't really have, I mean, what manuals are we looking at from World War One and World War Two, where these guys sat under so much? And now I'm not saying this is on that, that level. It's not, you know, to that level of World War One and World War Two. but I'm just saying that a lot of our mental health uh, people and a lot of the people that we talk to on the daily, they look at it from the Afghanistan war perspective. They're like, oh man, I know you had a, a tough couple of days, you know, you might have, you know, you lost, you probably lost three or four guys like we did that one deployment in Afghanistan. We had like three guys in our unit get killed and we had 10 guys in our unit get killed. I'm sitting here going like, dude, I went in with 130 and 67 were killed in two days. You know, I went in with a squad of 18 and seven of us walked out. Um, and this is not just one instance, this is on repeat, you know, throughout the time in Ukraine. And so talking to these people for mental health, a lot of them can't relate or understand in the way that would it would really help for them to. And that's something that we're having to work through. And one of the reasons I've been sharing some content from Ukraine and sharing some of my story, because I want others out there who have served there and been a part of it to know like, hey, you're not the only one. Like, I've got your back. I'm here for you. I'm here to talk and so on. And that also helps me. You know, I can be here to talk for somebody who also fought in Ukraine. But at the same time, that also provides someone for me to talk to, you know, mm -hmm. back, back and forth. They can talk to me and so on. Um, so it's been very different coming home, very weird, but we're working through it. No, I appreciate it, mate. And I want to give um, a shout out to Nick Laidlaw anyway, because uh, this is going to be my next question. A shout out to Nick Laidlaw for Battles and Beers for setting this up, uh, for introducing us, mate. Has he in some way been helping? Because I assume you won't know every guy, the foreign volunteer that was there. Has he has he helped you link you up to speak to guys, guys who have got out? Have you Have you linked up in any sense like that? Yeah, so I've linked up with a couple stateside, not through Nick particularly, uh, but guys that I've been connected with through a couple different units. Mm. Um, but I, I do want to give a shout out to Nick also because uh, he's been, you know, pretty available to talk. And uh, some of the stories he's outlined, I bought his first book. I, there's actually a story that I contributed to that book um, and I was able to buy his first book and, and read it and um, kind of get perspective from different sides, different viewpoints. Um, and uh, He's a, he's a great dude, um, and it, it's good to see some of his content and see the way that he's documenting the war from mm. uh, the fighter's perspective, not from the newspaper respect perspective, not from the news perspective or the politician's perspective, but from the ones on the ground, um, whether they're Russian or Ukrainian or civilians or Western volunteers or anything. Uh, he's really documenting that, and uh, it, it's amazing to see the work that he's putting into that. Yeah. That's really good. Um, and it was... And it's it's good having this is I think we've mentioned this before in terms of like the independent reporters are on the ground. So we had yeah. uh, Willie on Willie Matt Williams. He's Willie beating cancer. Um, so he's doing a lot of the independent stuff, and then Nick's doing his stuff. I think with the growing trend, like OSIN independent journalists, it's kind of what's kept it. What's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of kept it a little bit less mass media has kept it a little bit more real and well, you're actually kept, getting kept, an idea yeah it's kept the integrity of the stories together integrity there it's you helped, go <laughs> it's, yeah it, it's helped uh it's helped it not be um so partisan aligned or uh you know al aligned to a political ideology more so mm. to facts that you're taking from people on the ground um and that circles back to my one of my original points at the beginning where i said that I wasn't completely sold one way or the other until I got there and I interacted with these people and I was a part of their life and I was a part of their land fighting for them um, that I really got to understand their point of view. Uh, and that's what I encourage a lot of people to do is, you know, if you see a news article or you see news media and you try to formulate an opinion, don't do it off of the news. Uh, find people that have been there, served there, fought there or lived there. Um, and I'm not talking someone who's looking for their one 
10 seconds of fame. They're like, yeah, I'm Ukrainian, but Russia's doing the right thing. Um, I'm talking about people who have really been a part, paid the price there. Talk to them, you know, talk talk to these people and really get a feel uh, uh, for uh, what they experienced. And it, it might help you see that none of us are fighting to be Zelensky's puppets. None of us are fighting for, uh, you know, Western advancement. We're all we're there to support the Ukrainian people who are being slaughtered and killed by Russia. It's not by anyone else. It's not a, a proxy war. It's the fact that Russia invaded Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are defending themselves and they deserve help. Appreciate me. So, um, well, guys, it's going to be an hour and 45, but we're trying to cut them short because we can go into these conversations for ages. Um, so I know you said you've started doing more content and stuff. Where can people find you, mate? I will put these uh, links in the description for everyone as well, but where can everyone find you? So, for now, uh, people can find me on TikTok under True Freedom Unlimited. Um, I'm on TikTok there, True Freedom Unlimited. Until I get banned again, I uh, I get banned all the time. Uh, <laughs> my Instagram is underscore Mike Dunn underscore. That's my Instagram. You can find me there. Um, YouTube is True Freedom Unlimited. Also, um, so I, I've had a an online presence for several years. Uh, I was very politically involved here in the U.S. as a libertarian, uh, very heavily so to the point that. I had been featured in Vice News, uh, RT, Russia Today, the, the the news media for the Russian military, flew to the U.S. in 2020, came to my house and talked with me and did a, a film about me and my involvement in uh, anti-government uh, movements in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, now, you know, I just went and fought their people. Uh, but You're a part I was of their heavily propaganda. Involved. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was heavily <laughs> heavily involved uh politically so i had a very strong online presence so most of the time when my name starts getting out there again or content gets shared uh my accounts get banned but i'll always resurface and i'll always be around but for now that's where most people can find me if they want to follow and just if you want to see some stuff or you have questions uh people are welcome to ask me um long as it's respectful i'll generally answer it and uh i do want to throw this in there i know you said you don't edit your clips so i really want to throw this in there uh if you if you are having a tough time with PTSD, whether it be you served in Ukraine or you served anywhere else, um, I encourage you to get help in whatever way you can. You know, don't chase it in a bottle. It's not worth it. Um, you know, try to try to get help, try to talk, uh, open up. Uh, it, it'll help a lot. And you're not you're not a wuss for getting help. Get help. Mm -hmm. 100% mate. You, I you, uh, sorry, just add, I, th I just add, I'm not gonna, I think the sooner the better, isn't it? I think. Like for mm -hmm. most most things like mental health, the sooner you start talking about it, the sooner you start dealing with it. Not the easier, but the the better it'll be. Yep. Yeah, Definitely. and uh, and and regardless, uh, you know, I've had people. I, I see, I get hundreds of comments a day, um, sometimes thousands, and you know, I've I've had a lot where they're like, "Oh, you know, a real warrior wouldn't get help, or a real warrior wouldn't talk about what he's done, or a real warrior wouldn't." That's not true. A real warrior fights. It doesn't matter what he does after the fight, he fights. Um, and if you've been a part of that and you, you fought, uh, it doesn't take away from anything to get help. And as was said, get help as quick as possible. Um, I will say that it's helped me to be open about it and not bottled it up coming home. Um, I've been a little more open about it than a lot of people. You know, I haven't lived 30 years keeping it all inside. Uh, I've been able to be a little more open and talk because I want to help people and help people understand. And that's helped, in turn helped me. And so I do encourage people to open up, talk, get help as quick as you can. That's it. The only people that say that are the people that are not suffering. And that's always the case, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yep. Which is that. But thank, massive thank you for coming on, mate. I know obviously you're in Puerto Rico, yeah. try to enjoy yourself. But uh, thank you for coming on, mate. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate it. And I, I enjoyed the conversation and the questions. And kudos to you guys for all that you do. Thank you very much, Thank Mike. You, Cheers, Mike. Thank you very much.